The rise of the Shenbei is not a tale of military conquest or a carefully constructed empire. Unlike many of their contemporaries, the Shenbei emerged not from their own might, but from the vacuum left by the collapse of the Xiongnu, a powerful nomadic confederation. When the Xiongnu were defeated and their dominance over the northern steppes shattered, the Shenbei filled the void, inheriting the mantle of regional power by default rather than by force. Their leadership and political structure were markedly different from the centralized authority of their predecessors. The Shenbei were a collection of loosely connected tribes, with no hereditary rulers or established lines of succession. Leadership was not a matter of birthright, but of merit. Those who proved their bravery and competence were chosen to lead. This egalitarian approach meant that the Shenbei were often fragmented, lacking the unity that might have allowed them to establish a more formidable empire. Thomas J. Barfield in his book, On the Opening of the Shenbei Empire, writes, The Xinpai took control of the northern steppe after the defeat of the northern Sungnu, but in almost every respect, their empire was a secondary phenomenon. They inherited a position they were incapable of creating themselves. From China's point of view, the Xinpai appeared similar to the Sungnu, with whom the Han had long dealt. Yet in many ways, the Xinpai were different, and these differences had a profound effect on their relationship with China. Unlike the Sungnu, the Xinpai had a weak confederacy with little supertribal leadership. In the Xinpai political structure, authority was vested in petty chieftains who only occasionally united under a charismatic leader. This occurred but once under Tan Shi Huai, and even he never institutionalized his power, so central control ended at his death. Despite this, their fragmented structure became an asset in their interactions with the Han Dynasty. Unlike the unified Xiongnu, who could negotiate from a position of strength, the Xinbei's disunity made them more approachable, but also more complex for the Han to manage. The Chinese Empire finding it easier to deal with smaller and localized leaders provided the Xinbei tribes with gifts and subsidies in exchange for military support. This arrangement benefited the Han and allowed many small Xinbei leaders to gain from their relationships with China. However, to fully understand the rise of the Xinbei and their complex relationships with neighboring powers, it is necessary to first examine the earlier dominance of the Xiongnu and the shifts in power that shaped the northern steppes and paved the way for the Xinbei to rise. So in the history of ancient China, the nomadic tribes that roamed its northern frontiers played crucial roles in shaping the region's history. Among these, the Xiongnu stood as one of the most formidable forces for centuries. Their rule over the vast expanses of Outer and Inner Mongolia began in the 3rd century BC, under the leadership of the Shan Yu, based in the Orkhan region of what is now Mongolia. Yet, as time passed, internal strife and external pressures began to fracture their once mighty empire. In 44 BC, a turning point came when a Xiongnu leader named Che Che was forced out of Mongolia by a rival faction. Che Che moved west to the Balkhash region, signaling the start of a significant division within the Xiongnu. This split created two distinct groups. The Eastern Xiongnu, who remained in Mongolia and continued their long-standing conflicts with China, and the Western Xiongnu, who would eventually be known as the Huns, and pose a significant threat to the Roman Empire. The Eastern Xiongnu themselves fractured further in 48 AD, dividing into the Northern Xiongnu in Outer Mongolia, and the southern Xiongnu in Inner Mongolia, just north of the Great Wall. This fragmentation set the stage for a new power to rise on the steppes, the Xinbei. By 155 AD, the northern Xiongnu had been forced out of their region and was replaced by the Xinbei, a Mongol tribe from eastern Mongolia. The Xinbei quickly established their dominance across much of Mongolia, from the Manchurian border to the edges of western China. Meanwhile, the southern Xiongnu, pushed further south by the advancing Xinbei, settled in the Ordos region around the Yellow River and became allies of the Chinese Empire, much like the Germanic tribes that formed alliances with Rome. The Han Dynasty's approach to dealing with these nomadic tribes was a calculated strategy of using one group of barbarians to control another. It was the Han Dynasty who was responsible for the defeat of the northern Xiongnu. Before the fall of the northern Xiongnu, they were the strongest of all the nomadic tribes north of China, and hence a possible threat to them. And so they used both the southern Xiongnu and the emerging Xianbei tribes to attack the northern Xiongnu, which led to their eventual defeat. However, this tactic often produced unforeseen consequences, as it did following a military campaign against the northern Xiongnu in 88 AD. 
The campaign was intended to weaken the Xiongnu by turning their focus inward and exploiting their internal conflicts. While successful in its immediate goals, the campaign inadvertently created new challenges. After their defeat, many northern Xiongnu joined the Xianbei, which led to increased volatility on the steppes. The southern Xiongnu, previously allies of China, found themselves struggling against the newly bolstered northern Xiongnu and began raiding Chinese territories. The Xianbei, strengthened by these new additions, also grew more hostile toward China, especially after the end of internal conflicts among the nomads. As tensions escalated, the Xianbei adopted a strategy similar to that of the Xiongnu, relying heavily on raids to extract trade and subsidies from China. However, unlike the Xiongnu, who often balanced their raids with peace treaties, the Xianbei were far more aggressive, focusing almost exclusively on violent incursions. The Xianbei's political structure differed significantly from their predecessors. They lacked a strong centralized leadership, instead they were led by elected chiefs, whose power was not hereditary, but based on personal ability and charisma. This decentralized system made it difficult for the Xianbei to maintain long-term unity. Leaders often resorted to raiding China to secure immediate rewards and keep their tribes united, as peace treaties tended to weaken their authority by allowing individual chiefs to negotiate directly with China. One of the most notable Xianbei leaders was Tan Shi Huai, who rose to power in 156 AD at the age of 23. Despite his illegitimate birth, he was chosen as the overall chief due to his strength and capability. Tan Shi Huai led numerous successful raids against China, using warfare as a means to solidify his control and maintain the unity of the tribes. Unlike the Xiongnu leaders before him, Tan Shi Huai never sought peace with China, even when the Han court offered him high-ranking titles and treaties. His authority was firmly grounded in his military achievements, which dissuaded any rivals from challenging him. However, the leadership structure of the Xianbei was fragile. After Tan Shi Huai's death around 180 AD, the Xianbei tribes quickly descended into chaos. His son, unable to command the same respect and loyalty, was abandoned by many tribes. This highlighted the inherent instability of a political system heavily reliant on the personal charisma and success of its leaders. Recognizing the weaknesses in the Xianbei's leadership, China adjusted its strategy. When a new Xianbei leader, Ko Pining, rose to power, the Chinese didn't bother with treaties or war. Instead, they sent an assassin, effectively eliminating the threat and causing the Xianbei to fall into disunity once again. Without a strong leader to keep them united, the different tribes started to fight among themselves. This internal conflict made them vulnerable to attacks from other groups, and they began to lose their power. In the early 3rd century, the Xianbei Confederation broke up into several smaller tribes. These tribes continued to exist independently, but were not as powerful as they were under Tanshihui. Some of these tribes eventually moved south and became part of Chinese society, while others merged with other nomadic groups in the region. But as we read about these independent tribes, two of these tribes come out as the most notable with worthy achievements, who are worth looking into one by one. And these two tribes were the Murong, also known as the Muyong, and the Tauba, also known as the Tabgach. The Murong clan was a significant force in ancient China, especially in the Manchurian borderlands. Their story is one of transformation, from a nomadic tribe to a powerful state. Manchuria, located on China's northeastern border, became important during the establishment of the Wei dynasty under Cao Cao. The region's strategic location made it a stronghold for various powers over the centuries. Even when China was united, Manchuria was often the first to break away during times of chaos, and the first to be reabsorbed when stability returned. The Murong clan, of the Xianbei tribes, took advantage of this strategic location to establish their own state after the fall of the Sungnu. They began as a small disunited tribe, but gradually developed into a significant power in the region. During the Wei and Qin dynasties, the Murong clan acted both as allies and raiders of China, which was typical of many frontier tribes. They gained recognition and titles from the Chinese court for their military support, which helped them grow stronger. Over time, they began adopting Chinese customs and organizing themselves into a more structured state. Murong Hui, one of the most influential leaders of the Murong clan, played a crucial role in transforming the tribe into a stable and centralized state. He encouraged agriculture, established a walled capital, and introduced Chinese administrative practices, which helped solidify the Murong's power in the region. 
Morong Hui, who ruled from 283 to 333, was a visionary leader. He combined Chinese statecraft with traditional nomadic strategies to build a powerful state in Manchuria. Under his rule, the Murong clan became more settled, adopting farming and other Chinese practices while maintaining their nomadic roots. Huey's state became self-sufficient, producing its own grain and silk. He also used Chinese advisors to organize the army, which now included both infantry and tribal units. This new military structure proved effective in defending the Murong state and expanding its territory. After Huey's death, his successors continued to strengthen the state. Morong Huang, who succeeded Hui, declared himself King of Yen in 337, distancing the Morong from their tribal origins and positioning them as rulers of a new Chinese state. However, despite their efforts to integrate into Chinese society, the Morong faced internal challenges. The Morong rulers struggled with balancing traditional tribal customs with Chinese political practices. The preference for selecting the most capable leader, which was common among nomads, clashed with the Chinese system of primogeniture, where the eldest son inherits power. This tension led to internal conflicts and weakened the state. The Morong state reached its height under Morong Chui, but internal issues soon led to its decline. After the death of a strong ruler Morong Ko, the state was plagued by poor leadership and corruption. The young emperor Wei who lacked talent became a puppet, while ambitious nobles like Murong Ping exploited the state's resources for personal gain. The weakening of central authority combined with financial mismanagement left the Murong state vulnerable. In 370, just a few years after Murong Ko's death, the state collapsed under the weight of an invasion by Fujian, a rival leader from the west. The Murong court was captured, and their state was absorbed into Fujian's empire. Now, Fujian was the third monarch of the Dailed Chinese former Qin dynasty. The Qin dynasty was founded in 352 AD during the chaos that followed the collapse of the Chao state. Its leaders were from the Dai people who had long settled in the region. They chose the name Qin and made Changyang their capital, drawing inspiration from the ancient Qin dynasty that had first unified China. Fujian the ruler aimed to achieve a similar unification. Unlike the gradually developed Morong Yen state which was a product of the Shenbei tribes, the Qin state arose quickly amidst the instability of the time. Its leaders including Fu Jian were opportunists, who seized power and eliminated rivals. Fu Jian faced challenges in balancing the traditional tribal customs of his people with the Chinese-style government he adopted. His efforts to diminish the power of his own ethnic group created tensions and led to revolts, which eventually contributed to his downfall. The Qin dynasty's reliance on Chinese officials like Wang Meng to diminish tribal influence led to alienation of the Xianbei tribes. This tension ultimately weakened the dynasty and led to its collapse. The Liang region in the northwest became a stronghold for various Xianbei tribes and other nomadic groups. After the collapse of the Qin dynasty in the early 4th century, these tribes established mixed states that combined nomadic traditions with Chinese agricultural practices. However, Liang was isolated from central China which limited its influence. While the Xianbei tribes in Liang were able to create stable and self-sufficient states, they were unable to expand or conquer northern China due to their geographic isolation and the challenges of integrating different groups under a single administration. Despite their initial successes, the Xianbei tribes in Liang eventually fragmented. Governors sent from the capital who often had Chinese backgrounds established their own dynasties. After Fu Jian's death, the Xianbei tribes in Liang splintered into several smaller states, which were eventually absorbed by the Toba Wei dynasty. So this new power emerged in northern China, the Toba also known as the Tabgach. They were part of the Xianbei tribes, specifically the westernmost group. Unlike their more settled cousins, the Toba remained deeply rooted in the nomadic traditions of the steppe. The Toba were originally a loosely organized group of nomads with no permanent capital, often fleeing to the mountains when attacked. However, they eventually rose to power and became the unifiers of northern China. The Toba, led by Toba Kui, began to expand aggressively. They adopted a political structure known as dual organization, which they inherited from the Murong. This system allowed them to manage both tribal and Chinese populations effectively, with tribal affairs handled separately from civil administration. 
By using the dual organization model, the Toba were able to maintain control over a diverse population and solidify their power. They established a permanent capital at Pingcheng and eventually declared themselves the Wei Dynasty in 396 CE. Toba Kui and his successors expanded their territory through a series of conquests. They defeated the remnants of the Murong and other Xinbei tribes, gradually bringing all of northern China under their control. They also faced threats from other nomadic groups such as the Rurins and launched successful counterattacks to secure their borders. The Toba's military strength combined with their effective governance allowed them to dominate northern China. By 439, they had unified the region, establishing a powerful state that would last for over a century. The Wei dynasty was founded on a delicate balance between Chinese and tribal Xinbei elites. The capital Pingqing was located on the border to symbolize this compromise, even though it was difficult to supply and far from the administrative center. After the death of Emperor Toba Qin, his wife Dowager Empress Feng tried to Sinify, that is to make the Wei state more Chinese. Many Sinification efforts were made such as filling government positions with Chinese officials, banning Xinbei rituals and language at court, encouraging intermarriage between Chinese and Taoba elites, moving the capital to Luyang to distance the government from tribal influences. Moving the capital to Luyang marginalized the tribal elites and weakened the military, as the frontier troops were neglected and poorly supplied. Tribal troops, who were once key to the dynasty's power, became politically unreliable. The Wei's strategy shifted from aggression to defense, building walls and offering tributes instead of confronting frontier threats directly. The push for Chinese culture led to dissatisfaction among tribal soldiers, who were excluded from high-ranking positions. In 519 AD a riot erupted when a proposal was made to ban soldiers from holding government posts. The Rurin, a rival tribal group, manipulated the weakened Wei court to gain an advantage, leading to further instability. Corruption and poor management led to widespread rebellion among frontier troops. In 528, a tribal leader named Erchu Yong seized the capital Luyang and massacred the Wei court, and in this way effectively ended the dynasty. In 534, the Taoba split into two branches, Eastern Wei and Western Wei, each representing different cultural and political ideologies, both of which were eventually overthrown by their own ministers. This division marked the end of Manchurian rule and set the stage for China's reunification under the Sui and Tang dynasties. The Taoba's decline followed a familiar pattern in Sino-Mongol history, nomadic conquerors who became Sinicized and eventually lost their power. Their legacy, however, lived on through their contributions to Chinese culture, particularly in the realm of Buddhist art. With the decline of the Toba, a significant chapter in history came to an end. While much of this history is documented through written records, our understanding of the period is further expanded by archaeological discoveries, which tell us more about their influence in Central Asia. The Xianbei period, which took place after the fall of the Hunnic Empire, is one of the least studied periods in Central Asian archaeology. Recent excavations at the Beryl Burial Ground in the Kazakh Altai near the Buktarma River have provided new insights into this era, revealing the influence of the Xianbei nomadic tribes on the region's archaeological cultures. For decades, archaeologists had no idea that this site was connected to the Xianbei period. Initially, the artifacts found here were thought to belong to the early Turkic era, but recent excavations have changed everything. Since 1998, archaeologists have been excavating elite sites at Beryl, uncovering graves and memorials initially thought to belong to the early Turkic period. Intensive studies started in 2015, revealing a large-scale presence of Xinbei culture in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. Archaeologists discovered 55 structures, including 35 burials and 20 ritual sites, that are connected to the Xinbei period. These findings have expanded our understanding of the Xinbei's reach and influence. The Xinbei practiced specific burial rites, such as single burials often facing eastward, sometimes with their legs slightly bent, and occasionally with a horse beside them. The tradition of burying horses with humans reflects earlier cultural influences, like the Pazaric culture, and suggests a connection with other nomadic tribes in the region. Burials often included ground pits, stone boxes, and sometimes wooden structures. There were also distinctive stone arrangements on the surface. Ritual structures sometimes featuring animal sacrifices were also found, showcasing a mix of funerary customs. 
Various weapons and tools found in the burials provide clues about the military practices of the Shinbei. The Shinbei are noted for their advanced weaponry, including bows, arrowheads, and daggers. And the interesting thing is that these weapons were more developed than those of the Huns. The burials also included personal items like jewelry, combs, and mirrors, indicating the social status of the individuals. Some items, such as bronze bracelets and ornamental artifacts, reflect a blend of local and foreign cultural elements. The discoveries at Beryl show that the Shenbei had a significant presence in the Kazakh Altai and were part of a broader cultural exchange in Central Asia. The variety in burial practices and artifacts indicates interactions with multiple ethnic groups, and so the scholars suggest that the region was culturally diverse during the Shenbei period. Ongoing analysis of the barrel findings is expected to shed more light on the social structure and cultural practices of the Shinbei. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.